I got my suit on so you know it's going down this morning. Good to see you, church. Could you just turn to someone quick and say, hey, I'm glad that you're here this morning. We're awake, we're alive in this service. If you're watching online, we're thankful that you're tuning in. We love you, family. I'm honored to be able to continue the series in Genesis uh, with you. We can all watch patiently as Pastor Brian. The pressure is on him to not tip this thing over in front of the whole service while it's being live streamed. We like to love on our pastors. If you haven't figured that out by now, we love. I'll help you, buddy. I got you. Give it up for Pastor Brian. Yeah, buddy. Hey, we, uh, we took our middle school and high schoolers this weekend. We had our fall youth convention. State of Iowa came together, uh, middle school and high school, and God moved in a really powerful way. Um, the next generation... Um, we're calling them the now. They're, they're not the next church. They're the now church. They are hungry after what God has for them, and they're running hard after it. And so don't underestimate them. They're pretty amazing in how they're stepping out in faith, and God is using them. And so we're really proud of your kids. And it's been an honor to uh, be, I've been on staff in the high school role for, uh, I'm in my ninth year now at New Hope. And so I love this church. I know, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. At least that's what my wife tells me. So, hey, we're, uh, we've been, have you been enjoying this series in Genesis? I've been enjoying it. Um, really good just to break down a, a really important book of the Bible, and we're continuing that. You know, we talked about everything from creation and God speaking to something happening. We talked about what it means to be made in his image and likeness. Um, we talked about how we were created for a relationship with God community and that he created that and he gets to set the parameters and define it. And now we're in Genesis 3. All these have been great things. And if you know Genesis 3 is where it all falls apart. So we're talking about that this morning. Um, and so let me just pray. Jesus, we thank you that you're here. God, it's so fitting that we focused and remembered your sacrifice this morning. God, would you just continue to keep your, the cross at the forefront um, uh, of your word, of what you're speaking, and of what we're hearing this morning. We thank you, God, in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So. We're talking Genesis chapter 3. You can turn there. We'll be reading through the chapter this morning. Uh, and I want to talk just briefly as I, as I lay this out. And the goal this morning, the goal this morning is, is never condemnation. It's never shame. It's never fear or any of those things. We know in Jesus Christ, all those things are expelled. And so this morning, I, my prayer has been for you um, a, a self-reflection moment, um, a humility moment for us this morning. I, I'll say it again, but I believe that the life of a Christian, the life following Jesus is a life of repentance. It really is. And I know that word repentance can be a buzzword. It can be a, you know, Poke the, poke the hurt button uh, on your life, but it's not. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be a powerful, powerful opportunity that we get to meet with our Savior. And so we're going to have an opportunity at the end of service that, that we just get to come and bring our needs, bring our sins, bring our fears to Jesus. And if you have any sort of need this morning, we believe in his power, and we want you to come and be prayed for right? And so we'll give you an opportunity. But first, we'll dive in. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, my first point, God has a plan. God has a plan. He has a plan for not just creation. We've seen it happen. Not just how we are supposed to live and who we are. Not just in relationship. But God had a plan for his people in relationship with him. And his plan was perfect. It was perfect after he created everything and then he rested and in, in his relationship with Adam and Eve, it was perfect. And, and the rest of humanity, it was an intention to follow and live in the context of this perfect plan in the Garden of Eden where we had perfect harmony and perfect relationship. God had a plan and it was perfect. Adam and Eve were living the life that they were created to live. It was a beautiful picture of what God's relationship with his people, his creation was. And all they had to do was live. 
All they had to do was continue to live, and everything was laid out. God had laid it out, and and he said, hey, here's who you are. I give you perfect identity. Here's what you need. I have perfect provision for you. He said, here's what you do. It's a perfect plan, and it's a perfect purpose for you to follow and fulfill, and only God could give them those things. Only God could do that in this way, and they, they were living the dream in the garden, and we know not long after that, Something happened. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1, we see the serpent come on the scene. Genesis 3, chapter 1 says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals and the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees? We know Satan's coming on the scene as a serpent. It's interesting to me that that Eve isn't shocked by this encounter. It's non-threatening. It kind of seems like a comfortable conversation. It's implied that she maybe hasn't encountered a snake yet or this is just a normal day in the garden. She's been, it doesn't feel like a threat to her that the serpent is coming and having a conversation. And, and Satan's being coy, he's being subtle, he's cunning, he was shrewd. And he literally took the form of a creation that God called good. He took the form of something that God had said was good, and he started to use it to create bad, to create evil, to create sin and negative. And you know what? He still does that today. Did you know that there's only one creator that we serve? Satan is not a creative person. He's not a creator. He's dumb. He does the same thing over and over again, but give him credit, it keeps working. He takes something and he takes the form of something good and he comes non-threatening. Did God really say that? Do you really have to follow? Do you really believe that? He acts innocent and he shows up maybe as good and non-threatening in our lives today. In order, to, in order to trick us, in order to get us to follow exactly what he wants instead of what God has laid out in his perfect plan. See, Satan has to lie to us. Satan had to lie to them because here's the deal. If Satan was honest about the consequences that Adam and Eve would have to face and what the consequences they would bring in for everybody else for years and years to come, if he was honest about the consequences that we would face following him, we wouldn't do it. We would not follow because we'd be like, I don't want to choose something that leads me to death. No way. No way am I going to follow that. That's why he has to be cunning. He has to come in looking and feeling like something that's comfortable. He's going to make it feel like it's good for you, that you need it, that you want it, that, that you deserve it, like he did with Eve. Because if we truly knew the consequences, we wouldn't choose those things, would we? I, I guarantee you all of us have made decisions in this place, including myself, that I look back on and go, if I only would have just thought through that. And sometimes I don't even know, like the, the consequences I couldn't even foresee. And I'm going, man, I wish I, I wish I would have known in advance I wouldn't have made that decision. That's exactly how Satan comes on the scene here in Genesis and in our lives. In our lives. Is did God really say? He questions, but it's, it's a non-threatening question at first. Gets you to think a little bit. Did God really say, can I really trust him? Eve responds in verse two and three, of course, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's the only fruit from, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. If you do, you will die. She knows. She knows what God said, and Satan continues to question. He continues to push forward. In verse 4, Satan continues, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The enemy presents. He, He questions at first, did God really say Can you really trust him? 
And then when he has, when he has Eve thinking, then he outright opposes God. No, 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 no. He didn't say that. No, 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 no. You can't trust him. No, he's holding out on you. You know better for yourself. You know yourself best. You know what's the best for you. Sound familiar to us today? And Satan presents, or Satan presents this thing as, as, hey, it's knowledge. It's good for you. This is something you want. You won't die. And Eve wanted what she thought sin could provide, that she could provide for herself, this promise of wisdom and knowledge and to be like God. And that's what sin in our lives does. It promises to provide what only God, our creator, can provide. That's what sin, the greatest lie is from Satan, that I can provide or that sin can provide something I only can get from God himself. It promises peace. It promises love and acceptance and security and comfort and pleasure and control. But you start to realize that sin truly can't provide any of those things, can it? They can, it, can, it can provide a, a counterfeit, a fake version that only lasts for a moment, and then we realize, wow, I didn't actually gain anything at all, that only God can provide those things. Sin is really the act of me trying to fulfill something that I can only get from God without God. I'm trying to get what I really want from God, but I'm fulfilling it with me. I'm the one that's trying to be the provider. I'm trying to take the control. See, sin isn't just this classic, you're disobeying, you're rebelling, but what sin actually is, it's treating something in my life as the provider, capital P. It's treating that thing, that need, that person as my healer. It's treating that thing as my prince of peace. It's treating that thing as the lover of my soul. It's treating that thing as my identity. Do you see how Satan twists that in us to say, hey, you know you better than anyone else, and so you need to provide. That's why God hates sin. That's why God hates sin, not just because it's disobedience. Of course, if you're a parent, you don't like being disobeyed. Why does he hate it? Because it's not his plan, and his plan is perfect and good for us. It's everything we need and more. And when we try to turn that and be the provider for ourselves, that's when bad things start to happen. God had provided everything that Adam and Eve needed, and yet they still tried to provide for themselves. It's an interesting thing, and we can look outside looking in at this text and go, man, they should have been smarter. Come on. Come on, I wouldn't have done that. Wait a minute, I did it yesterday. I did that this morning. I know what God had pre provision for me and I still try to provide for myself in whatever way. I didn't trust that God had everything and more that was enough for me. And you break sin down. Sin really is not trusting God to provide what he promised. I'm just not trusting you, God, to provide what you promised, so I'm gonna provide for myself. You will be like God, he says to Eve. It's irony, the lie is irony. Why, because she's already like God. She is already made in his image and likeness, and so he's lying to her saying, you need this, you need to be this or do this, and he creates this, this false vacuum or need in our lives out of something that she already has obtained. He does it today. He does it today. He's get, Satan's always getting us to strive for things that we already have in Jesus. He's getting us to strive for things that we already are in Jesus. I see it with teenagers all the time. They do it, they do it, you know what? I think teenagers and adults are a lot alike. Teenagers just, just do it more openly, I think. We do the same thing. We see it all the time, myself included. I'm striving for something I already am. What a lie. What a lie. That I'm, I'm, I'm truly, fully loved by God, and it's not even earned, and yet I'm spending my life trying to earn love from people in different ways. I'm, I'm truly fully chosen, 
and yet I'm striving for acceptance. You see what I'm saying? Satan lies to you and to me to make me feel like I need something that I already have in Jesus. And it causes me to act out in certain ways and try to do things in certain ways when God has already given those things to me. See, God has a plan. God has a plan and it's perfect, but we have a choice. Eve had a choice now. Adam and Eve had a choice. God gave humanity this beautiful thing called free will. Why would he do that when he probably knew they wouldn't, they wouldn't make it? <laughs> Why did he do that? Because if I handcuff you and bring you to prom, does that mean that you love me? No. You didn't choose me. And real love means I choose in the face of an option, another choice. And so God had to create a choice for them to say, hey, choose me. I chose you, God said, now choose me. I'm gonna give you an opportunity. I'm not some robot that's programmed in that I have to follow God. He's saying, hey, choose me. I have a perfect plan and I'm giving you a choice. And for us to truly love God, we have to choose God. And if I don't choose him, then it's not love. Because removal of choice means that I'm just being controlled. And so God in his goodness lets his creation choose him. And that still reigns true today. They had a choice. We have a choice today. We are presented with God's perfect plan versus our plan. And we have a choice every single day, every moment. God, do I choose your perfect plan for me? Do I choose to love you? Do I choose what you have for me? Because here's the deal, there's no other choice than God's plan or my plan. There's no other in between. It's not, well, yeah, of course I want the promises of God, but those can wait. I'm gonna have what I want now and I'll get that later. There's not, oh God, I'm gonna choose this area over here for me. I'm gonna provide for me over here and I'll trust you over here. I have to choose fully, I can't have both. And Eve and Adam had a choice to make in that moment. Do I listen to God or do I listen to this serpent in myself? Continuing Genesis 3, verse 6, it says, The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and it, its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. I find it interesting that scripture says, you know, like she was convinced. Adam didn't even get lied to. He just was like, sure. <laughs> cool, I'm in. That's why, that's why scripture says all sin originated from Adam. Satan was, con or, or Eve was convinced. Adam just chose. He didn't even need to be deceived. She was convinced. She believed this lie, and in an instant, in an instant, everything that the enemy told her actually happened. Everything, their eyes were open, they gained this knowledge, but it wasn't what they thought it was. It actually wasn't what they wanted to see, it wasn't what they wanted to know, and that was shame. That was shame. They were ashamed of themselves. It said before, we, we read in, in previous chapters that they were naked and they had no shame. And now we see that they're like, whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of who I am. And they tried to cover themselves and I think that was a metaphor for shame covering them. Shame covered them and entered in. Fear of what God would do. I think there's two different types of relationship that we can have with a father. I think you get an, a, a fender bender. I did this in high school. Fender bender, nothing crazy, I actually hit my buddy. And I could have a thought, depending on my relationship with my dad, my thought can either be, I'm, I'm in trouble, my dad is gonna kill me, or I'm in trouble, I need my dad's help. You see the difference there? And what was and what could have been, I'm in trouble and I need my heavenly father. Turn to, I'm in trouble, he's gonna kill me. And so they ran and they hid and they were covered in shame because they believed a lie. 
Every sin, every act against God's plan and choosing our own plan begins with a lie. Every single one. You can trace it in your life, in my life. Every decision I make, retrace the steps. It always starts here. It always starts with a lie believed, convinced. You do not act without a thought. You do not act without believing something first and accepting something first, like Eve. She was convinced and therefore she acted. Here's the problem for us today. Eve entertained a conversation with Satan. She entertained it. She talked back and forth with him. She entertained these lies. And that's what temptation actually is. It's the conversation you get into to trust God or trust myself. Should I, should I not, should I? And it's a conversation that we have with Satan, that we have with our own sinful natures. And we're so weak as a people, as humanity, that the second we get into the conversation, we've usually already made a decision. That when I get in the conversation, it's game over. It's game over for me. Here's the thought, why am I entertaining a conversation with Satan? Why do I even entertain this thought? If I know that anything he brings to me is gonna bring me death and shame and fear, then why even talk to him? Why do I get in these moments where I, I find myself almost paralyzed and then I'm in my own head, should I do that? Should I respond in this way? Should I this, should I that? Why am I even entering in the conversation? Scripture screams, flee from these things. Do you know the only person to ever entertain a conversation with Satan and not sin was Jesus? The only person. There's no reason we should be even entertaining these lies and these conversations. And I don't know why we do it. Because most of the time, almost all the time, we get in that conversation, it's done. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. God has a plan. We have a choice to make every day. Do I trust my creator? Do I trust my provider? Or do I trust me? He has a plan, we have a choice. And choices have consequences. Genesis 3, pick it up in verse 8, it says, when, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Do you see that? This is, he hasn't talked like this before. I was afraid because I'm ashamed. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Have you eaten? The man replied, it was the woman. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us men. Help us husbands, Lord. It was her who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she, she replied, that's why I ate it. It's not my fault. It's not my fault, God, it was his fault. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling on the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband. What? And you will desire to control your husband? That can't be right. But he will rule over you. And the, and the man said, and to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you, and all your life you'll struggle to scratch a living from it. And it will grow thorns and thistles for you, and though you will eat of its grains, and by the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made, and you are made from dust, for you, for you are made from dust, and you will return to dust. Man, man. God, why are you so harsh? I made one decision. Why are you punishing me, God? Where's your good grace, Father? 
Don't I thought we this whole relationship thing was built on grace and mercy. Here's the deal when you think about these consequences that's what they are they're consequences that every decision I make I have to be responsible for what's going to happen after. I chose and therefore I'm responsible. And I'm responsible because I wanted my own way. Do you know what I found out in my short 30 years of life? or long, depending on how you look at it. What I have found out is that a lot of times God's judgment in my life is allowing me to get what I want. He's allowing me to choose. Okay, you know I love you, that's not good, that's not my way, that's not my best for you. I love you, don't do it. Okay, you wanna choose that, I'll let you choose. And then I get all these consequences, I get all this stuff, and I go, why are you beating me up? And he's like, I gave you what you wanted. I'll never forget, I was absolutely blackout drunk at a party, I was running from God, drugs, alcohol, girls, everything, heavily addicted to pornography, totally running from God, because I said, I want my way, I wanna do my way, God, I know what's best for me, these are the things that I want, and God allowed me. And it brought me to, uh, even to a place mentally where I wanted to commit suicide. I, ne- I, I wasn't amounting to anything. I was afraid. I was full of shame. And that's caused me to drink and do drugs even more, just to be numb. And I woke up in somebody's bathroom covered in puke. And I'll never forget the moment I had where God spoke to my heart. And he said, did you get everything you wanted? And it wasn't condescending. It wasn't mean. It felt it came in love because he was revealing to me, I got everything I wanted. And it wasn't what I needed. I believe sometimes he allows us to get what we wanted to show us what we need. He allows us to get what we want to show us what we need. And I believe this more than ever showed Adam and Eve, I'm your provider. I had a perfect plan. I had a perfect plan for you. My choice has consequences. What we choose today still has consequences. It's not just for me. I know that Adam and Eve's consequences didn't just affect them, it affected everybody. My sin, my, my choices have, can affect my family, my kids, my friends, my workplace, my everything. It has consequences when I choose my way. And shame is one of the biggest ones that makes me run from a God who loves me, that makes me hide from a God who, who just wants to restore me. And he went after them. In his love and his mercy and his good grace, he went after them. I find it interesting that Satan, the one who tempts, and he's called the tempter, he's also called the accuser in scripture. scripture. He calls, he accuses us. He's the the one that, the the very guy that made me choose and, and convince me that this is a good decision. It's the very guy that turns on me instantly and says, that was horrible. Actually, you're horrible. You can never be used. Because that's, that's the difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is saying, I did wrong. Shame says, I am wrong. I am wrong. I am broken. I am bad. And, and he's so quick to turn on us, to beat us up. Come on, it'll be so good. You'll love it. It'll feel good. You need this. They deserve it. And then we do it. And instantly the tune has changed. How dare you? God hates you. Can you imagine if they found out? If they only knew what you were doing? Man, you're such a terrible person. How, would you, how, could, how could you do this? We're not created to live that way. But it causes this vicious cycle that Satan gets us in. Convinces us to do something and it beats us up and beats us up and hides in shame and fear and convinces us again. That's not the life I was created to live. I wasn't created to live in shame, live in fear. I wasn't created to choose my own way. I wasn't created to be the provider of my own life. See, these things that Satan presents with us, they'll never fulfill what I'm really looking for. They'll never fulfill it. You may have heard that sin always takes you farther than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to stay. That was true with Adam and Eve. One decision had consequence. 
And the ultimate consequence was pushing them away from God, them running from God. But like I said, praise God for being so great in his mercy in the midst of consequence, he went after them. They were hiding from God. They separated from God, and yet God still showed up. And you know that God knows everything, so he's not asking these questions to get answers. He's asking the questions, hey, where are you? What happened? Not as a beat you up, but as an opportunity for them to come clean. That's why he does it. What happened? What's going on? That's what conviction is. Not condemnation, but conviction. His Holy Spirit still shows up in our life after we make a decision and says, hey, what's up? What happened? We can't be doing, that. that's gonna hurt you. That's not what God wants for you. And God's love for us, as we just remembered early in this service, is so great for us, even in the midst of me not choosing it and choosing God and running and hiding and shame and rebellion. He chases me. His love is too great to just leave us separated from him. I find it interesting that you fast forward and after these consequences, fast forward to verse 21, it says that, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. This is a powerful and prophetic verse that the Lord God took from an animal as a sacrifice to make something to cover them correctly. In the midst of shame covering them up and shame causing them to hide, God said, "Uh uh-uh, that's not the covering that I have for you. I'll still be provider, and I will cover you as you go. I will cover you in the midst of consequence. And prophetic, yes, because it's prophetic to what he would do to send his own son and the lengths that he would go to cover us yet in the midst of our shame, in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of us being enemies of God, he would send his son to cover us. Is anyone thankful for that today? that his covering is so great in the midst of it. He'll pay the price for our sin. He'll pay the price we'll never be able to pay. He did that for us. He died a death that was for me. That consequence was death. And God said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm gonna cover it. These are my people, I love them. And today, today, And tomorrow, we have a choice. Like I said, God has a plan, we have a choice. Those choices have consequences. And there's good consequences to choices. Did you know that? There's good consequences that if I choose to go back to God, I choose to run back to him because his arms are always open in the moment or, 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 or whenever I choose to run to him, the consequences are a good covering. He reminds me of that perfect identity that he created me with. He reminds me of his perfect provision and he reminds me of his perfect plan and purpose that he has for me. That's how good my God is, but I have to choose I have to choose, and we have a choice to make even this morning. I don't know what you came in with this morning. You may have, then you may be sitting here and go, man, I chose to be my own provider this morning. Can I tell you once again, that shame that you have placed on yourself, the shame that Satan's trying to reap on you, you may be sitting in the moment, I've sat in your seat to go where a preacher's saying, hey, we're gonna repent, and I go, I can't go up there. It's even happened to me as a pastor, I can't go up there. What if what, 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 people are going to judge him? What do they think? How about I don't care? <laughs> I don't care, Satan. You can't hide me. You can't keep me hidden anymore. You can't keep me from running to God. Like I said at the beginning, the life of a Christian is a life of repentance. If it's been a long time since you repented, you probably do. You probably do. I'm just going to be honest with you. Why? Because we reap the consequences of a sinful nature. So everybody in this place, we all have sin. We all choose ourselves. We all choose our own way. So nobody in this place is sitting here going, well, they don't do that. We all do. So this is a message, not just for the first time. If you're here, if you're visiting, if you're listening online, and you're like, man, I've never chosen God. I've never, he's never been my provider. What better time to run to the Savior? Or you've been following Jesus for 50 years. What better time 
to run to the Savior. You see it? The cross is, le- or the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level. We're all level at the foot of the cross, all needing a Savior. And I don't have to be slave to sin. I don't have to be slave to it anymore. That I can run to Jesus out of repentance. Would you stand with me? Worship team, would you just come? Did you know it's exhausting to run from God? That's what it's called the burden in the New Testament that we carry, that we were never meant to carry. It's exhausting. It's harder to run from God than it is to God. It's much harder. It's scary to step out. It's scary to say, I need God. It's scary to say, I need his, his salvation. It's scary to say, I need forgiveness. I messed up. It's scary to open yourself up and admit, I, I, I need to be humble enough to go, God, I messed up. It's scary, but it's scarier not to. It's scarier not to run to God. Scripture says, God, where can I run from your presence? He's always chasing after us. He's always running after us. I love it. Even singing these songs this morning, you just hear just the love of God. And I don't want, like I said, no shame, no fear, no condemnation in this place, but would you feel the love of God this morning drawing you back to him as a good dad that says, I'm here, I've never left, I've never moved. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. I need God. I need God. Would you bow your heads this morning? I know we need God. If you're in this place and you would say, Pastor Luke, I've never given my life to him. I want him to be my savior, my Lord, and my provider, my master. I want to choose him. I'm living a life of sin. I'm living a life running, covered in shame, and I want to give that to him. I want to give my life to him. We want to pray with you. It's the greatest decision you could ever make, running to God. Would you just raise a hand that I could just pray alongside you? And that's just a raise of your hand as a commitment to follow Jesus. Absolutely, I see your hand. Absolutely, I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Absolutely, I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. I see your hand. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for these hands raised. Thank you, God, for these lives given. That, that they're, they're coming to you saying, God, I need a Savior. Thank you, Lord, that this is the greatest decision they could ever do is come and run to you. Thank you, God, that, the, that their sin and their past and, their, and, and, <clears throat> and that their life says shame on you, but God, the cross says shame off of you. God, their, your future that you have for them. So thank you that they've given their lives to you this morning to follow you, to follow you. Thank you, Jesus. Could everyone else just, could we look up at me? Because I just want to open the altars up. I want to create a space in here where we just run to Jesus. There's no shame, no condemnation in this place. I'll be the first one at the altar to say, God, I'm not, I need to get right with you again. It's a beautiful place to be. It's the most powerful place you can be. And we just want to open up the altars as we sing a song again for you to come and just declare we talk about moving or raising our hands is a physical display an outward display of an inward decision it's an outward display of an inward decision so i'm taking a step of running toward god because i know he ran towards me and if you need prayer for anything this morning we believe in the power of prayer because we believe in the power of our god and we want to pray for you as well Can we just create this space in any context for you of running to Jesus? Any context? So I'm gonna pray and then our prayer team's gonna come down in just a moment. Would you come down and respond with them as we sing? Jesus, we thank you for your perfect sacrifice, your great love for us that cuts out all fear and removes shame. God, and reminds us of who we are and how we're saved and loved by you. God, I thank you for the people in this place. Help us to respond to you. We need you, God. We thank you that you're here and you're waiting. Let your love just just empower people this morning as they give these burdens to you, God. We love you. In your mighty name, amen. You came down into our mess, into the situation, and you rescued us, Father. You met us right where we're at. Thank you, God, for your loving kindness, for your grace and your mercy. 
love you, Jesus. You know, I've heard it said that the closer you get to God, the more you realize how broken you are, how sinful you are. The more you, you meet with him, the more you see his face and encounter his goodness and his holiness, the more you realize, I'm filthy rags. And Satan wants to turn that and say, you are horrible and shame. But God's illuminating that to remind us, hey, I'm here. I'm everything you need and more. I'm always here. You always can run to me. I haven't moved. And so that's what I mean, a life of repentance. I should always be at the feet of Jesus. I need you more today, God, than I needed you yesterday. And God's always ready. His love never fails. His love never fails. We love you, church. God loves you. Thank you for making a step towards him today. He loves you. If you would, don't forget the little offering we have this morning, family in our church. Would you go this week in grace and love? Watching online, thanks for tuning in. We love you, church. We love you. Come back tonight. Bring your families back tonight. Be blessed this week.